You guys have room for some more? You want to do blood pressure first? No, let's go a little bit more. Tell me when you fall asleep. Um, when we look at bloods, the blood itself, we need to look at the component, we need to look at the function, then we go through right, red blood cells, white blood cells. Have you heard of platelets before? Yeah? The coagulation? Oh, look, clotting, that's what we're going to talk about that. We talked briefly about plasma, and then oxygen, di carbon dioxide transport, and then we do blood groups to finish that one off. And then we do the lab of blood groups. So blood is a fluid transportation tissue. It's a connective tissue. It has connective tissue parts. It has cells. Connective tissue has cells, and connective tissue has an extracellular matrix. And an extracellular matrix always has fiber. In blood, it's not fiber that you see. It's called soluble fiber. So you could dissolve it in liquid. And so we call that fiber there fibrinogen. That's a little side note. We talk, I think we talked briefly about that. When you see the word GEN, usually it's in an enzyme. That word comes from genesis, as in creation. And so that means usually that is a, in the process of being made. So fibrinogen is soluble, and once we make it into fibrin, right here, fibrin, then it's insoluble and it participates out in liquid. It makes the blood clumpy. All right? I know it's almost kind of productive a little bit. Soluble means it's like sugar in, in water. It's dissolved. Insoluble means it's not dissolved. It sticks out from the water. So in blood, that becomes very important. So we'll talk a lot about that because that's a very, well, not a lot, but more. That's a very delicate situation in the blood. But the blood has all those connective tissue components. It's got, it's got the cells, it's got the, the extracellular matrix, and that's the liquid, that's the plasma, is liquid, and the fibers. We look, in our body, we have about 8% of our weight is blood. A person of 70 kilograms, about 5.6 liters, that's 5.6 liters. A gallon, a quart, a pint, and something else. That way, since liters are not that easy in America. In, in, in America. Um, the cellular component of blood, all cellular components of blood are made in the red bone marrow. That's important. So that includes red blood cells, white blood cells, and then these platelets. They're all made in red bone marrow. So that's inside the bone. Remember the bone was made on the outside? It's mostly this compact bone. That's a long time ago in chapter four. On the outside, it's like the, the, the bone that looks smooth, it's compact, and then you see a bone. If a bone breaks, it's got spicules coming out, like it's not really smooth. We can't see it on the plastic, um, but in real bone. And on the inside, these spicules are like scaffolding bone, and there's a lot of room, a lot of space in between. And inside that space, we got the red bone marrow. Not in all bones, but in many bones, like in a hip bone, for example. So if somebody has leukemia, we have a problem with the bone cell, I mean, the, the blood cell formation, the white blood cell formation. And they take the biopsy out of here to see what's going on. They take the biopsy out of the red bone marrow to see what's going on. Blood cells are expressed as a percentage of total blood volume and we call that the hematocrit. So you see the word hematocrit, you know that's the cellular components. The higher the hematocrit, the less liquid it has percentage, right? It's the more um, sticky the block gets, the more dense the block gets. So average is about 45%. So 45% of blood is cells, 55% of blood is the rest. We look at functions, the RBCs, the red blood cells, oh look, there's a spelling thing. That is no T. The erythropoi, the erythrocytes, are red blood, 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 red blood cells, and they transport oxygen from the lungs to the tissues and carbon dioxide back to the lungs. Good, that's a function. We like that function. 
White blood cells defend against pathogens and foreign bodies. That's an immune function. We'll talk about the white blood cells. We'll pick up the immune system on Monday. And then we have a whole bunch of other stuff dissolved in plasma. <clears throat> and there's another function, is transport. So the, the blood can transport nutrients, waste, or hormones through it and deliver it to the body. So it's like a freeway system of bringing things around the country. It's pretty good. Blood coagulation happens when a vessel is broken and needs repair. So when we cut a vessel, you know you're bleeding. You cut yourself, you're bleeding. That, there's a vessel that's cut. Somehow we've got to patch that vessel up. So what happens is the insoluble fiber in here, that fibrinogen, somehow magically becomes strands that, that precipitate out that they can make a patch. And they call them that fibrin. And that's an insoluble fiber because it does not Insoluble means not dissolve in water. And then together with the platelets, they can patch up that break and repair the vessel. So that's cool. That's the short of that coagulation thing. Then also, what can carry heat that is produced by internal organs to the body surface. So the blood on the inside can pick up heat when it's warm and it can bring it to the outside. Or we can, and, and through that process, we get, of course, flush and we feel warm, but we cool the inside of the body down a little bit. Also, when it's really, really cold, the blood will go away from the outside and preserve it on the inside. That's when, you know, your finger falls off and it's like, Oh, too bad, you still have a heart that's pumping. So that's more important. Um, but thank God, we don't have it here. We have to deal with other stuff um, in this latitude. So the cells of blood are the, the main ones we have here are the red blood cells, the erythrocytes. Ha, I got it spelled right here. We have per microliter about four and a half to five and a half million. Whoa. A microliter, that's like a millimeter time. You know what a millimeter is? A, mil a meter is like this. A decimeter is a tenth. A centi is a hundred. Centi means a hundred. Centimeter is a hundred of that. And a milli means a thousand. That's like a thousands of this. So that's this little thing. So a cube of that has four and a half to five and a half million RBCs in it. To me, it's just, I don't understand it. That's one of those numbers. It's just a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. And so this is around, the cells of them are round, so they're circular, but the disc shape which both sides going inside. So the both sides of the disc are <coughs> concave, like going into a cave. Um, and that gives us optimal surface to volume ratio. What the heck is that? That means everywhere on this cell, the distance that the oxygen has to travel to the every point is the same distance, pretty much. Or it's optimal. So that the, the amount of surface it has to the amount of inside volume it has is optimum for the gas to exchange. If it were just round, it would be way too much volume for its surface to figure that out. That's why it's disc. Plus it's convenient when you go through blood vessels, they can stack up and they go through all the smaller capillaries that way. Like in single file. Um, the red iron containing protein hemoglobin, we talked about hemoglobin a little bit when we talked about protein. It's probably one of those important ones for us. For us, they bind reversibly to oxygen. So the hemoglobin, actually the iron in it, the heme in it, can attract an oxygen and let it go. Oxygen-rich blood is a little bit brighter red, and oxygen-poor is a little bit darker red. That's why they have the veins, or the, the deoxygenated blood, I should say, looking bluish on the models versus red for, for the oxygen-containing um, vessels. And then up here, we just talk about the diffusion distance 
which I mentioned, uh, that that's optimal with this configuration here. So that's that. Um, Fishers need auction inflates the auction product, that mean RBC production. Uh, the RBC production is regulated by erythropoietin, and that's a hormone done by the kidneys. Renal is kidney. The kidneys what makes the pee, the filtering of the blood. So dialysis patients, the ones who gotta go with the kidney thing, help with the kidney, they are often deficient in this hormone created this resource with RBC count, giving them anemia. Anemia is when we don't have too much of that. We have too little RBCs. That means we have too little oxygen carrying capacity. That means we have weakness. We're fatigued. That's a function of anemia. If you don't have any energy, I always totally sluggish. Anemia could be one reason for that. An increased number of red blood cells is not anemia, that's called polycytemia. Poly means many. Polycytemia. And, and they do that sometimes. Athletes, they go, they do blood doping. They go up to, to um, high altitude, like Colorado City or Colorado Springs, and, and where they train, and then the blood there has, le the, the air has less oxygen, so the blood needs to be thicker. We need more RBCs made to carry the same amount of oxygen around because it's not as easy accessible from the air. Um, and then what they do is they come down to sea level to compete. And so at that point, they have more RBCs in the blood, and so they have more oxygen going to the tissues. That means they have more energy. They do that artificially by taking blood out and then pump, putting it into the body right before competition. But that can be dangerous. I mean, all of this can be dangerous, but definitely when you do it artificially, I mean, I don't know, but you know, you can win that way, so that's good. Um, RBCs only live 120 days, three months. They're developed from stem cells in a bone marrow at a rate of about 100, and listen to this, 160 million every minute. Well, if you got four million or five million in that little squeeny tiny thing, you're gonna make water. Um, they're broken down by the liver and the spleen. The iron is reused for recycling, uh, but other portions are used, uh, are excreted, then uh, some of them are used in bio salts. Have you heard of gallbladder? Gallbladder stones? So the bile is, is made by the liver and it's dumped into the stomach, into the gut, to, to emulsify fat. And emulsifying fat means you know, fat in water is like salad dressing, the oil and the vinegar. The fat clumps together. It always wants to stay together. You have to shake it before you pour it, otherwise it's together. And, and it's the same in a liquid environment in the stomach because it's mostly a watery environment, so the fat will clump together. So we have this uh, molecule, the bile, that has, on one side, it has a, it's polar. On the other side, it's non-polar. And that's back to the hydrophobic hydrophilic. So now you can have the if this is the if this is the nonpolar, if this is the polar, you can have the fat be attached on the inside and make these little things, these little globs, with the polar going to the water that nicely swings around in the water, and the fat doesn't all accumulate because it gets interspersed by these little things. By the bile salt that then emulsify. That's the same the soap in the water when you do dishes. It's the same concept of the soap. It takes the oil out, it emulsifies the oil. So we can use this, the byproduct of the red blood cell breakdown for that. So that's pretty cool. That way we can um, digest fat better. Good, so that brings me then to the white blood cells. So now per microliter, we don't have five million. Now we got somewhere between four and 8,000. That's much, much less. Still a lot, but. When we look at the white blood cells, the technical term is leukocytosis. Leuco means white. Oh, leukocyte, sorry. Um, we have two main, uh, two main groups that are differentiated by how they stain under the microscope. One are the granulocytes. When you take stain in the microscope, they create little granules that we can see. And the other ones are A granulocytes. That means they do not. A means they do not have a granule. 
<coughs> granulocytes are three of them, neutrophil, eosinophil, basophil, Ooh, more terms. And then agranulocytes, we've got lymphocytes and monocytes. Lifespan of these suckers is from a few hours to a lifespan, a lifetime, sorry. Um, and the white blood cells, you probably know that, they make up the structure of the immune system and then together with lymphoid organs, from the, a lot of them in the lymphatic system, they help us implement the immune system. This is how they look. And we have these plaques. And for us, this is how they look. And so that's what we're gonna do in lab a little bit too. Because over time, for the final, we're gonna, for the last test, we're gonna identify what's this, what's this, what's this. So that's for that, but it's not that big of a deal. It's usually a quite of a simple one. But I, I like this, uh, you know, if you have to go further in the anatomy stuff, there's little, small little descriptions here that kind of are, are nice. I don't want to go too heavy into them. I want to more go with the function. When, um, but before we do the different ones, we also have these terms, leuco, the term leukocytosis is an increase in leukopenia, wherever that went. Oh, here. A leukocytosis is an increase of white blood cells over 10,000 per microliter, which usually means an infection. Swollen lymph nodes is what that is. So that's swollen lymph nodes. If we go below 2,000, we got a little bit of a problem. We don't have enough white blood cells. They call it leukopenia. The word penia means diminished. Osteoporosis is brittle bone. Before we have that, we have osteopenia, they call that, because we have diminished bone density. So that word penia comes back over and over. Um, that usually means a damage to the side of the formation and can be corticosteroids. Uh -huh. Don't do too many corticosteroids. Don't take too much prednisone. Use that for when you really need it. I freak out when I have people that are like in their 30s or even 20s, they're on steroids unless they really need them. I'm like, what are you going to do when you're 60? And I have stories for people that call, they're all freaked out because their parent or so had, had prednisone forever and they didn't realize that it damages the immune system and now they're always sick. Because one of the problems with our re what is the term? I heard the term retail medicine. Our medical system is retail medicine. It's like high volume retail medicine. And in this high volume retail medicine environment, we miss a whole bunch of stuff. So one of the reasons why you take this class, I think, is to understand more of the stuff so we can ask critical questions and say, well, slow down, let's think about this. Because very often, when I have some patients that come in and they're like, I mean, sometimes it's just, a lot of times, I guess, is, is the way the patient presents, but you also, you go, sometimes you go like, who thought about this case before? You know, for me, it's especially when it's with musculoskeletal stuff that doesn't clear up. And um, anyway, uh, but, but just, you know, we need to know about this a little bit. Uh, of course, we can have the cancer, leukopenia can also be, um, le uh, leukemia can cause that too, cancer. Except for some white blood cells, and, um, red, and the white blood cells, most of them, and the red blood cells mature and proliferate both in the bone marrow, the red bone marrow. So they're all made there, some of the white blood cells, namely the lymphocytes, we'll talk about those, are the, those are the B and T cells. Have you heard T cells, AIDS? You heard of AIDS, right? That's when the T cells don't work, there are not enough T cells around. The HIV causes the T cells to go down and then AIDS is when we get the uh, disease. Uh, expression. Um, and so they are made in the thymus, which is right here behind the sternum. Everybody else, uh, no, they're made, they're made, sorry, they're made in the red bone marrow, but they mature, they learn how to be in this world in the thymus. Everybody else has a maturity, and I guess we could call that differentiation, in the red bone marrow. So that's the only difference with that. But we'll go, we'll get to that in a little bit when we talk about the thymus and the, the B and T cells um, more in depth. 
then I'll bring it off. For right now, just think most of the red, most of the bone cell, most of the blood cells are made in the red bone marrow. So now, let's think about this. White blood cells are here to defend us against infections. They are here to help us get rid of the bad invaders, get rid of the bad stuff, get rid of some of the cancer stuff too. Um, a lot of the cancer stuff actually. So, uh, but when we have, let's say we have a cut out in here and we need, and we're bleeding and a lot of bad gunk comes in and gets infected and all that stuff. What, what are we gonna do about that? What's the body gonna do about that? The body's gonna send a lot, a lot of white blood cells to that area that we got caught. And the question then comes on how the hell does the body know what to do with that? How do the white blood cells know to go there? And they do a few things. They have chemokines, whatever, the chemicals, like perfume chemicals or something, they are secreted from the area where the injury is happening. And they send out a signal that attracts white blood cells. And so they call that process chemotaxis. So the chemical is like the taxi, sends it right to the place where it needs to go. So that's kind of cool. I think of it like it's a perfume that is like, oh, it smells so good, I gotta go there. It's like they do that. And they do that via motion, amoebic motion. So they, they, they can move like an amoeba, they can, Roll, they can move through space that way. So they're, they're mobile. And they also, if they are in red blood cell, and if they're in blood vessels, they also have to escape the blood vessel in order to go over the tissue and help in the area where the problem is. And that process of walking through or passing through the vessel wall is known as diapedesis. Dio means through. Pedesis means foot, or ped means foot. So those are three terms that are sort of helpful with this, the chemotaxis, the amoeba emotion, and the diapedesis. So that gives us a, a way to bring white blood cells to the area where they are needed. And so most of the blood cells, uh, most of the white blood cells that are actually going to that area first in an infection are the neutrophils. And the neutrophils, they phagocytose. The word phagocytosis, phage means eating. So they ingest foreign material, which is a pathogen, and destroy it by releasing lysosomal enzymes. Remember we talked about that lysosome, which has that enzymes in it, is one of the organelles, when you go back to the cells. And so the lysosomal enzymes have a lot of hydrogen peroxide in it. They can destroy stuff, they break it down. Uh, and then often what happens is when they break things down and eat up the bad gunk that get, it got into the system, they often then perish themselves. And when we have pus, and most of us go like, ooh, that's so gross. You go, go like, wow, look at these cells, they died for me. They are so cool, they died for me. I'm so important to them. When you feel depressed, find some pus and go and be grateful about it, huh? How would that be? I know. So they reach the site of inflammation first <clears throat> and are a main part of the what we call a non-specific immunity. When we talk about the immune system, we have some immunity that's non-specific. That's like you get caught, you need to fix it. But then we have some immunity that's very specific, like you gotta get chicken pox. And once you have the chicken pox, the system knows what chicken pox looks like, so you don't get it anymore. That's called a specific immunity. The word specific refers to what makes you sick. That specific thing you know you're gonna be attacking real fast again. <clears throat> That's the whole idea of, of immunizations, vaccinations, and so forth. All right, so that's that one very important. So when I look at my plaque, and I look at my plaque, and I only have four plaques. For some reason, they didn't open the cabinet, so we just have to do with what we got. But we'll have it open next time and we'll look it over and over again. But you see there is these things, they have like these dots, these red dots. There's one that has blue dots, and then there's some that have no, no dots, but there's dots. So they're neutral. Ha! Where the dots look neutral, they look like the background, those are neutrophils. 
So the granules are neutral. That's why I came up with that name. At least I'm going with that story. Um, and then when we do them in lab, I'll just go around and show you. So it's not going to be too heavy. But then we have the ones with the red dots are known as the eosinophils. And they phagocytose antibody antigen complexes and bond to excess histamine, limiting allergic reaction. They're also here to attack parasitic worms. We have parasitic worms in our system. Yeah, you would if you don't have those who help get rid of them. Mm -hmm. And so when we study those, those are the ones who have the red dots, or they're more orangey looking, but they're reddish. And we want to me memorize sort of, they limit allergic reactions, and they attack parasitic worms. That's what they do. Because then we got the basophils, and the basophils are the bluish ones, and they release histamine and heparin. Uh-oh. Histamine is the hypersensitivity reaction. That's all the sneezing. That's the allergies, histamine and heparin. Increasing, what they do is they increase vascular permeability and contract smooth muscle. And then it's also an anticoagulant uh, in terms of the heparin. And so that can give you a lot of sneezing going on. So then you have those who kind of help with binding to the histamine and reducing the allergic reaction. So we've got to play a little teeter-totter with that. Yeah, that's your... Yeah, they're saying this year is really going to be a heavy allergy season. Have you heard of that? I've been sneezing a lot already. You know. Soon we can't go outside anymore. All these filters on. So those are the three granulocytes. Then we got the A granulocytes. And we have two types. We have lymphocytes. So this is where you have to be careful. We have all of the white blood cells are known as leukocytes. The specific group that I'm talking here are known as lymphocytes. So they're more ly lymphatic versus Leuco, not white, but it's a very close name. So those are the B and T cells. They usually have a small, a large nucleus and are small while in the bloodstream, but they get large once they reside in lymphoid organs, which means your lymph nodes or the spleen is also a lymphoid organ. But that's the lymph node, for example. Um, they are in those organs then, and they're sitting there. They're living there. It's like their home. And so once they're in those situated places, then they become nice and large. Um, and those are the cells of the specific immunity. They remember the chicken pox or the flu vaccine, the flu that they gave you. And I'm going to start taking the flu vaccine. I know, I listened to his. Have you ever listened to Joe Rogan? He is funny, man. He doesn't edit his stuff at all. He just puts it straight up. But he's got like the biggest. So yeah, he's got some very interesting people that he talks to. He's a little goofy, but you know, he's straightforward. And he talked to this guy who was on, they had a, a, a thing about AIDS, no, about um, vaccines and autism. And he's got an autistic child himself and he's an immunologist guy and specialist and all that. It was very, very interesting. I should figure out that episode and ship it if you want it. Uh, because it, it, talked, it talked a lot about like autism and vaccines can't go together because the autistic genes get created in the second uh, trimester and stuff like that. I mean, really down to, down to, fairly down to earth for whatever, how much you can put that down to earth. But he also talked about uh, uh, the flu and how it's just really is one of the big, the big killers in the, in, in the Western world. And so he was very pro-flu vaccine. So I was starting to think, maybe I should do that. Anyway, the B cells and the T cells are part of the specific immunity. So they get your chicken pox, your measles, all of that that you get vaccinated from. They learn that from your vaccination or for being exposed, they learn what the pathology looks like, the pathogen. The T cells are themselves involved in the immune response. So they go attack the bad stuff themselves. They're like shooting it down with a gun. They have like AK-47. Um, so they call that cell mediated. The B cells make fragments of cells, small little fragments,
that they release into the bloodstream and then they bind to the pathogens, clumping the pathogens together or, or tagging and saying like, hey, you gotta come kill this because it's a wrong thing. We don't want it. So the B cells are the taggers. I call them taggers. And the tags are antibodies. They call the tags they call antibodies. So antibodies are made by our body to protect against stuff. Of course, if it goes out of hand, the antibodies protect the wrong stuff. That's our stuff. And then we have a problem because then we have a wrong attack. Autoimmune disease is something like that. Um, and then the term antigen is on the pathogen. So the tags are ours, our tags for bad stuff. Our tags for antigens, which are a pathogen. So the pathogen is what makes you sick. Makes sick, right? That's the pathogen, makes you path gives you pathology. The antigen is on the pathogen. So technically speaking, the antigen is the part of the pathogen that the antibody recognizes. So it's almost, then you can almost say like it's the tag of the pathogen. But for our purposes, we want to associate antigen with the bad stuff, with the pathogen. That way, and the antibodies with our own stuff. And so when we get to the next chapter, we sort of have that language down already. Um, yeah, that's basically that. Let's see what's next. Because now we're probably going to get into blood typing soon. Because that's where that comes up, big time. Um, Oh no, look at that, we forgot one. We forgot, the last one is a monocyte. And a monocyte are large, uh, contain a pygmy shaped nucleus and have many lysosomes in it and then most of them live outside of the bloodstream as macrophages. Uh huh. So you know, so you associate monocytes with macrophages. For example, monocytes that reside in the bone we call osteoclasts. We talked about the osteoblasts make bone, they build bone, the osteocytes maintain bone, and the osteoclasts break down bone and like put calcium in the bloodstream so we have enough calcium in the bloodstream, stuff like that. They are actually monocytes. They just went to the, to the bone and just are living in the bone for their lifespan. We got some that go live in the liver, they call them Kupfer cells, we got some they put in the Lungs, they call them long John, longer horn cells. No, dust cells. The longer horn cells are in the skin. We'll talk about those when we get to those organs. But those are all monocytes that live in the tissues as macrophages. And what are macrophages do? Macro means big, phage means eating. They eat big stuff. They eat pathogens. What they do is they phagocytose and destroy bacteria, fungi, parasites, as well as worn out damaged cells. Whew, that's a lot of stuff, so they're helping us. That's part of the non-specific immunity, but then they do something else that's really cool. They take and eat a pathogen, the antigen part, or they eat the pathogen and actually they present then the antigens on their surface and say, ha, I got infected, I got tagged and I need to be destroyed. And by the way, you can learn about this pathology while you're here because I just picked it up and I recognized it. And so they call them now specifically antigen presenting cells or dendritic cells because they look like they have all these spicules coming out like dendrites. Um, and they are sort of the link between the non-specific immunity and the specific immunity because once once this cell just eats the stuff and it recognizes some antigen and it presents it's like, and then the B and T cells can come in and do their job and recognize it more and can do the antibodies and all that kind of stuff. So that's cool. A, P, C. We're going to talk more about those when we're going to talk about the immune system. Here we go. They're all there. On here, we did the ones with the granules, 
the red, the neutral, the blue, and then we got these two. We got the big ones and the small ones with a marble background. The marble background are the B cells, T cells, the lymphocytes. The one with the big thing in the middle and the pink background are the monocytes. That makes them five. The last one we have is going to be the blue dots, and the blue dots are going to be platelets. And let's see, I think we're going to get to the platelets pretty soon. I hope so. Yeah, look at that, thrombocytes. Platelets slash thrombocytes. <clears throat> They're formed in a red bone marrow by what's called megakaryocytes. And again, you have to test review. If these words freak you out, just go with the flow and listen to the story and the names. Like, I don't remember names in the story. I was going to read up on it again. It's like that. And you, re you remember the names you need to know for the test. Okay? For a lot of the functional stuff. And if you haven't gone to test review, we'll just do it after class. For the functional stuff, it's all written out there. And for the terms, I will be clear about what we need to know for the test on that. Um, so they're made by megakaryocytes, and then they're released in the bloodstream as small irregular shaped cell fragments. Those are the blue things, the platelets. They are destroyed within five to 10 days by the spleen, and they play a major role in the blood clotting, and we call that coagulation. Blood clotting, coagulation. There's a, you know, a mega stem cell, a megakaryocyte makes these fragments, and then it sends them into the bloodstream as platelets. That's pretty much what that meant. So when we have an injury to a vessel, we can be life-threatening, obviously, because we lose a lot of blood, or we can lose a lot of blood, and we need to patch that blood vessel up. We need to make sure we don't lose that blood. So first we do, we can slow down the bleeding by calling, by constricting the involved vessels, and we call that hemostasis. The bleeding is slowed down, so we don't just squirt blood out wherever we cut ourselves. Um, this is followed then by thrombocytes, which are the platelets that are being deposited along the injured vessel wall as they stick to one another. They call that aggregation, the sticking part, and they form a platelet plot when they do that. And then blood coagulation comes next. And this is a very delicate process because now we have the platelets that make this plug. We have the, the blood that doesn't flow as heavy, but now we've got to coagulate. Now we've now we got to um, make fibrin out of fibrinogen. So we have to make this, this, in, this soluble fiber into an insoluble fiber that then can be like threads, you know, like gluey threads patching up those platelets even more. This is a very, very delicate process because if we have fibrin, when we don't need fibrin, we can create floating fragments in the body and get giving us strokes. We can, we can chop those fragments and fall off, or you know, they can just precipitate in solution, which is gonna be a problem. So when we look at um, making fibrin from fibrinogen, we have a long process. This is only like two steps out of like a 12, 13 step process that I didn't put up because you can hardly see. There's so many little names and numbers. It doesn't, it's just confusing. But they're called clotting factors. Um, that is the cascade. And they make from a prothrombin to a thrombin. And then that is the, the thrombin is what, what transforms the fibrinogen into an insoluble fiber called fibrin. So you don't need to name, worry about all these names. It's just I need you to understand the concept. And I need you to know that it's very, very delicate because we do not want to have strokes all over the place. We do not want to have fragments floating around. Um, and if you go to a higher anatomy class, then you can learn that right there. Um, yeah, and go straight to town, but it's still too complicated for me. But that's basically what we have. We have the blood slowing down, we have the uh, platelets coagulating, coming together, aggregating, and then we're gonna have fibrin made out of fibrinogen and that patches the whole thing up. After the vessel is healed, the enzyme plasmin dissolves 
the thrombus, which is the patch, and we call that fibrinolysis. So the dissolving process is also very important because we don't just want to have these fragments floating around in the body. Oh, in the bloodstream, I guess. And that brings me to plasma, the blood plasma. <clears throat> So when you take blood, you put it in a vial, you put it in a spinner called the centrifuge, centrifuge spin it around with the, you know, pointing outward so everything pushes to the outside that's heavier. <clears throat> so all the stuff goes down that's, um, that's uh, 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 heavy and that's basically the red blood cells are the heaviest because of the iron and the white blood cells come on top of that and then everything else is plasma. So we got, look at that, white blood cells and platelets, they call that the buffy coat because it's not red looking, it's like, not foamy, but it's a little wider. And then above that is the, is the more yellowy plasma. And you see, that's about normal, that's anemia, that's polycythemia. Just so gets us an idea a little bit. Um, when we look at plasma, we have serum, and that's the plasma without the clotting factor, the fibrinogen. And that's also, that's very, very important because if you have plasma and you let it sitting around, it's gonna coagulate. So you're gonna to have to take the fibrin part, the fibrinogen out of it so it doesn't turn into fibrin. It doesn't, so, you know, it stays insoluble. And so that's then the serum that we get. Most of the plasma is water, about 90% is water. 10% is dissolved substances, about 70% of that 10% is proteins, and then we have nutrients, vitamins, hormones, all that other stuff, and some electrolytes. Plasma proteins, the function of those are transportation of lipids, blood clotting stuff, and then antibodies for the immune system. Those are plasma proteins, and then the ones that do the osmotic pressure that we talked about. Those are also proteins. Albumin is the most numerous proteins there. They establish the osmotic pressure for blood besides leaving, having all the roles. So the albumin is the one that is a big player in what I talked about. The blood goes from the arteriole into the capillaries and has to be picked up by the manual side. So that's the, al um, the albumin that does a lot of that. I know, I'm almost losing you guys, huh? Let's see how much more we got. I think we're getting there. Yeah, we're getting there. We did that. Ha <laughs> ha. Lipoproteins are the ones, the proteins that, that transport fat through the system uh, because fat is insoluble in water and water environment. Since water, blood is hydrophilic, water loving, and fat is hydrophobic, water fearing, we have several classes of these lipoproteins, and that's where we get into this cholesterol stuff for us. We have a VLDL and an LDL, and they carry lipids from the liver to body tissues. Liver to body tissues. And we consider them the good, I mean, we consider them the bad cholesterol. Because they disperse the, we disperse the lipids in the body. They take it from the liver and get it into the body. Now, the lipids are very important. Cholesterol, for example, helps heal tissue. It's very important, too. But it depends on how much and the quantity. And so then the other one is the HDL. And if you remember, when you have a blood panel, the total cholesterol is counted, then the LDL and the HDL is counted. The LDL is the bad one. The HDL is the good one. So the ratio becomes important. And so the HDL is a good one because it brings lipids back to the liver. And that's why it's known as the good cholesterol, because it removes the lipids from the body and brings it to the liver for processing. The ratio is important, and is, um, the ratio as well as the total cholesterol has predictive value for individuals risk for vascular occlusion and localized blood clots. <clears throat> now, Having said that, reading Dean Ornish's book, 
him saying we have to be careful because values like cholesterol or blood pressure are easily to measure and give us an objective value and then we can take medication to change the objective value. That does not tell us the total picture of the health of a person in, in that respect, in a cardiovascular respect. There's many other factors. So we always have to be very careful when you get blood values, that's certainly an, a marker, an indicator of something. But when we just take a medication to reduce that blood value, we've reduced the blood value. What effect that does on health is not always the same. For example, they have apparently diabetes medications that bring the, um, the measurement in the blood of the A1AC or whatever it's called, bring that down. That is not meaning that you don't have diabetes. This means that level is better. There's many other things that contribute to all of that. So we always want to be quantifying, you know, what's going on. And uh, you know, with medicine, I like to be critical in the thinking because we tend to just sort of throw it at us and, 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 and take it because it takes a problem, puts it out of the way. Um, most. No, never mind. Let's not go there. We'll go with that. So, but we do want to, of course, take it and, and be clear about it and understand what we got and then critically think about what we're going to do about it. For example, you can do you know, high intensity exercises and you're going to get that HDL moved up a little and the LDL moved down a little. So, that's the lipoproteins, the HDL, LDL. Then we have these other proteins that are the antibodies, the immunoglobulins. Those are glycoproteins that give us the specific immunity by, they're made by the B cells, and then they bind to the antigens, tagging them, we just talked about that before, and we call that opsonization, actually, as a term, the tagging process. And then the white blood cells can go destroy it. We have five groups, or flavors of those, we have Ig is immunoglobulin. They spell it Ig. They have one to G. They have an A. They have an M. They have an E, and they have a D. I'm not going to go through all of those, but I really like this list. When we go to another school or pathology or so, we have to learn them. If we do that, and then you have to learn the different groups. One is found in lymph vessel, lymph stuff. One is you know see see the pictures here also. So it's it's good to have it's good to have these sort of hints and these kind of um, well I like these where there's pictures and a little bit of text it helps us digest material pretty well and slows everything down I'm not that good with just words um, antibodies activate um, for example so they tag they opsonize um, um, the antigen but they also can actually activate a a membrane attack complex and that can perforate a hole in the pathogen cell's wall rendering them harmless. If you take a, 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 a being's boundary away, it's, it's one of the life necessary things. Remember we have this, uh, so it's not a survival need, it's a necessary function, a boundary is a necessary function for us. If we don't have a boundary, we're dissolving with the rest of, of nature and that's the end of us. If a bacteria has no boundary, a cell membrane, it's going to be rendered harmless. It's going to, the inside is going to move out, and the outside comes in and destroys it. So that's also good. That's kind of like, the MAC is kind of like a, a, big, a big gun that makes a hole in the cell. That brings it to the transport. Hemoglobin transports oxygen. Oxygenation happens in the lungs. We talked about that already. One hemoglobin picks up one oxygen. In a tissue, we have deoxygenation. That means the, the, red, the, the oxygen gets away from the red blood cells into the um, tissues. And then from there, once we've used the oxygen, we have CO2 as the byproduct. And that 90% of that transport is bound chemically to soluble bicarbonate. Oh, holy cow, something else. Which we talked about, no, we did not talk about that. No, we talked about bicarbonate. We talked about acids and bases. We talked about the buffering system. And the bicarbonates are the, one, the stuff you get in Alka-Seltzer, that the stomach acid reducer. Uh, it, picks up, it picks up excessive um, hydrogen ions. 
and so it works and picks up the, the um, it can transport the carbon dioxide that way in through the, through the blood into the lungs and then from there get rid of the carbon dioxide in the lungs as a gas. So the carbon dioxide, most of it is not bound to hemoglobin, it's chemically bound to bicarbonate as we get rid of it and breathe it out in the lungs. If you want to lose weight, the more carbon dioxide you breathe out, the more carbons you get rid of, fat is a lot of carbon chains. So you breathe the weight out. That's kind of the way you get rid of the brain and the weight through the CO2. So that's kind of interesting. Um, that's good enough for that. Oxygen and carbon dioxide transport influence each other. The oxygenated hemoglobin acts as a stronger base than if oxygenated and therefore tolerates more hydrogen ions which are, which are produced when CO2 is picked up from the tissues. So basically, the more, um, the more carbon dioxide is inside the tissues, the faster the oxygen is going to get rid uh, of, the, of the hemoglobin into the tissues and helps the tissues be more oxygenated. So you have a lot of fine-tuning things that will go on um, as you get deeper into understanding the system to make sure all the tissues are perfused properly and not all left behind. Or not left behind. Good. And that brings me to the cool stuff, blood groups. And that's the end of the story after that. So then you're released from sitting here. When we transfuse blood, we have more than 100 different types of cell surface glycoproteins. So those are blood group antigens. An antigen, you think of an antigen and make you sick. That's what you think of an antigen. Now we have self-antigens, they don't make us sick. Our body knows them. But then we have all these pathogens, these other antigens that come in, and the body will respond and react to that. Now, if you have red blood cells, and your red blood cells have some surface, has some, um, uh, has a, a surface proteins that cause the reaction, they look as antigens by somebody else, you or somebody else will react to that. And then the red blood cells will clump together, and you participate out, and you, never mind, that can kill you. And so it was very important that we understand the antigens and then the antibodies in one's system to make sure we don't have a cross reaction of a blood that's given to a recipient. Incompatible blood can, can agglutinate, damage RBCs, which is called hemolysis, and possibly killing a patient. To prevent this, the blood is serologically matched. Is it the right blood before the transfusion? In humans, we have two systems. We have the ABO system, and then we have the RH system. The RH is the positive negative thing. And so we've got to talk about those a little bit more, more right now. This is what we want to pay attention. And I'm just going to read it before I explain it wrong. So the ABO most blood groups are four groups that are determined by antigen A and antigen B that are carried on red blood cells. So we have, therefore, group A, group B, group AB, and group zero, or nothing, O. The antigen on the red blood cell is what we're looking at. So group A has an antigen, an antigen A. So that's an antigen, let's just say antigen A on it. Group B has an antigen B on it. The red blood cells do. The AB has both an, an A and a B. And O has nothing. Haha, -ha. smooth as can be. So if you are in your own body, group A will not react. But if you are giving this blood to somebody else, no, if you give this blood yeah, to somebody else who doesn't have the A's, that body will say like, what the heck are these antigens? We gotta do something about it. And that body is having antibodies against that antigen, and they call them anti, well here, anti-A. 
All right, so I should take different calls actually. Hold on. We'll do the B, we'll do the B red. So that the one has the one that has the blood that is the B blood will have antibodies in its system, the person that are against the other one. Against the antigen A. So if you give this patient this blood is going to not work out because the antibodies A will interact with the antigen A on the blood cell. So antigen is on the cell itself. It's what gives the name, the blood name. That's where the trick comes in. And the antibody is usually the opposing blood in this system. So with the B, if you only have a, a blood group uh, with the antigen A, you're going to have anti-Bs in your system. So if you then take this blood and put it in the wrong patient, it's going to cross-react. Bad idea. Then you're going to have the one person who has antigen A and antigen B on its blood, and that person is in luck. There is no antibodies. But if you have a blood that has no antigen on it, you're going to have both anti body B and antibody A. A, A, antibody A. So this person is a lucky, lucky person because you can give him any kind of blood you want to give him. You can give him the blood with the A on it, who cares? You can give him blood with the B on it, who cares? You can give him the O, the O can go to anybody because the O does not respond to anybody. And so the AB is known as the universal recipient and then the O is screwed because the O can get blood from A or can get blood from B or from AB, everything reacts. The only thing that doesn't react is O to O. So in a blood bank you want all the blood to be O's. If you go to the bank you don't want to be O. Understand that? So the O is the universal donor whereas the AB is the universal recipient. But keep in mind, your blood is named after what is on your blood cell. A, B, A, B, or nothing. Because then we get more complicated. We have the RH factor. And the RH factor is the last one here. It's from a system, the rhesus monkey. So they call it RH because of rhesus monkeys. So that was discovered. When guinea pigs were injected repeatedly with blood from rhesus monkeys and they all had blood problems. People possess an antigen for that, the RH, that's known as the RH positive. The people who do not have that antigen on the blood cells are known as RH negative, positive or negative. Unlike though the ABO cyst antibodies, the RH antibodies are found only after the recipient is sensitized. That is after the immune system learns about the RH antigen and slowly makes antibodies against them. So a first exposure does not cause a rupture of the foreign RBCs, but a second exposure will. That's like how specific immunity works. That's basically you got exposed to the chickenpox or the rhesus, the RH now in this respect. And then you get sensitized and then you have antibodies against that. Now in the chickenpox, that's great. You don't get the chickenpox anymore. In this, it's not so great because where it gets messy is if you have an RH, you got an RH positive baby in a negative mom. And when the baby is born, you're gonna have spillage. And so now the mom will make antibodies against the positive, the RH positive part. Now this baby's fine, the second baby ain't gonna be fine. Because now the mom has antibodies slowly created against the RH. Now if she doesn't have blood with RH positive in it, it doesn't matter. Then antibodies will not attack that blood, but the antibodies will attack the blood of the baby if he has a bad second pregnancy with RH positive blood in it. And that won't work. Then they made Rogan, and that's all fixed. And so, um, so that's right here explained. This becomes a problem if an RH-negative mom gives 
labor to an orange positive child during which some of the child's RBCs spill over to the maternal blood, sensitizing the maternal blood. In a second pregnancy to an RH positive baby, the mother's blood now having antibodies against it cross into the baby's blood that will agglutinate the, the baby's RBCs and that's a problem. We can prevent that medically but we need to know if the baby is positive and the mom is negative. And then we can prevent that from happening. And I think it's called Rogan, but I haven't written it down, so I'm not so sure if I'm wrong with that. Isn't that cute? The footsie? I love that thing. I know. You know what you're touching here. Sometimes it's so funny when I have a patient and the mom is pregnant, the pregnant patient, and I, can, I get to palpate the baby a little. Oh, it's so cute. <laughs> so that is good info, though. That's a nice picture because it helps us understand it. And with that, look at that, it's finished.